But thank you for having me. I mean, it's an honor, a privilege, all that great stuff. And But it, I'm serious. There's no place I'd rather be than right here, right now. We're all alive, and it's a beautiful thing, and we're together. So it's kind of a little bit of unity. That's, that's pretty good. So um, as I was thinking about this program tonight, I'm going to try to multitask here if I can do it. And we're in action. Okay. Um, I was hearkening back to a presentation I gave to the Mountain Home Rotary Club late 90s, 98, 99, something like that, nearly 20 years ago. And at that time, it was, I, I gave a, a show about um, an Alaska trip I did with my father. So father's on Alaska trip was amazing, kind of the dreaded vacation slideshow, right? You know, it's like, but they invited me back, nobody walked out, so that was, that was all good. But back then, there was you know, a crowd about like this, maybe a little bit more. There was one camera in the room. 1999. And I think it was the secretary that was charged with taking <coughs> photographs and um, the minutes and all that good stuff. So we fast forward 20 years, everybody has a camera today. <laughs> Every single one of you probably has it with you. If not, we all have a camera. So I've kind of been really fortunate to witness the evolution of photography in these last 20 years to where nobody would have had a camera here. And now everybody has a camera. It's ubiquitous. They're all over the place. So what's that mean for me, for a professional photographer? It's a lot of competition. <laughs> and I tell you, these cameras do wonderful jobs, too. They're amazing. I mean, everybody. So, and so back then, I kind of built up this following, so to speak, by way of the Baxter Bulletin, by way of Gannett. They kind of hired me, said, We're, go practice your craft. We're going to pay you. And... Um, Go out and do your thing. So by just the sure fact I was on the paper, I built up a little following. Rotary invited me, and I've spoke to a lot of clubs in, in the interim. And so today, every one of you, though, I have this big publisher, the traditional publishing behind me, the Gannett, Fox News, NBC, you know, these big publishing houses that were really the only way you could get your stuff out there to be associated with those. Otherwise, you would just share whatever you wanted to share with you know, your extended family or your friends and stuff like that. But now, today, every single one of you are also a publisher. You have your following of maybe 50 people or friends and family, maybe more, a couple hundred. And so every time you publish something or you know, post something on Facebook or Instagram, you are publishing to your following. And you know how it ripples out, so even if you only have 50, followers or likes or whatever it may be, you know, it can ripple out to who knows. So everyone is a publisher and I just find that's kind of fascinating. And so with that in mind, we'll, I'm just going to kind of show some photographs, an eclectic <laughs> mix of photographs and we'll talk about, you know, my ideas about publishing these photographs at the time, republishing them now, um, how I kind of look at publishing things on social media now. But it's a really, it's, a, it's amazing too that, I'll just briefly talk about the trouble the newspaper industries have. I think everybody's aware of it, it's tough, the whole media landscape. And it's because of the, it's because everybody's a publisher now. It used to be the only thing that published was the paper, right? Now everybody's a publisher. And if you publish a little, you know, notice about my new grandkid, people love that too, baby. So that's the universal, right? A little baby, who can't say yes to a brand new baby? Even if you don't know that person, when you're scrolling down that feed and you see a new baby, you stop for a couple seconds and go, yes, this is cool. Which used to be a mainstay of newspapers too, death notices, birth notices, especially smaller newspapers, that's kind of by the wayside. But when somebody stops on your little baby for five, 10 seconds and moves on, that's five or 10 seconds, they're not stopping at the Baxter Bulletin, that they're not stopping at NBC or Fox, right? And so at times millions of people, it's tough, man. It's so segregated out there. So anyway, enough of that sort of history about publishing and stuff like that. So um, I'm gonna ask, I've got a couple like slideshows here, but one is 10 years ago, we had the ice storm, right? Mm -hmm. And we had the floods, and we had the tornado in 2008, I think it was February 5th, 2008. I remember vividly, I was driving home, here comes the call on the scanner, you know, and that's, so we, I run out to Gasville. So would you guys like to see a quick slideshow mm -hmm. on sure. the yes. storms yes. and harken back to those fun times? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. It was really fun. Yeah, I know, that's horrible to say that, but. 
So can I even find a dirt it? So this will take a second. So we're gonna go like this. Play from the right side. All systems are go. So this is a, this is a show I actually gave back around that time. And so this is a book that the Bulletin pr published at that time. We just call it The Storms, really a clever name, right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> the Storms. So anyway, but those were the three big events that happened, the natural events that happened that, that year. The tornado, February 5th, the big floods that year, and then in early 2009, the ice storm, which we, if most of you guys were probably here, probably remember. So that's the book we published. I don't think there's any left in circulation, so if you have one. And um, most of the photographs were mine, just because I worked there. Um, I got to design the whole thing and everything. But, so this is one of the first photographs I made that night in Gasville. And uh, wow, you know, you, what do you do? You pull up, and luckily you were hearing nobody was hurt at that time. And so I remember, I think it wasn't, it wasn't you, Jeff. It was another sheriff's deputy that I knew most of the guys, and all very good, um, that kind of said, Kevin, you're underneath these lines, get your ass out of here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but that was, that was kind of verbatim, and I kind of said, oh yeah, you're right. You know, that's kind of verbatim. You know, you kind of want, you get excited about I'm documenting. Excited is, about is the right word, but your heart's also, at the very same time, your kind of adrenaline's going, I want to get these photographs, I want to tell the story. You're kind of wondering what's happening to human beings. I mean, there's people that are affected, lost houses and stuff. So that was the first thing I photographed. Wow. That was, I just thought it neat, kind of iconic McDonald's. photograph. McDonald's, you know, the golden arches weren't standing too proud that night, you know? So then I got to go up with uh, Benny and the sheriff in the sheriff's helicopter. Very fortunate, super fortunate in my career to get to do things like that. But look at that. Gasville. I mean, I remember um, a National Weather Service meteorologist called and wanted to talk to me personally because he'd seen my gallery of photographs and sands the instruments on the ground, so to speak, that can measure wind speed. The way they determine F, F1 to F5 is the damage that structures take. And so he asked me all about that, and he said, that's how we determined it was, I think, an F3, was because of the photographs I took, and he, I thought, wow, that's cool. So just some more aerial photographs. Can, can we turn down the lights even more? Is that possible? Sure. Unless, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Is that okay? Is that okay? okay. KT's barbecue there. Yeah, I mean, there's the owner of Letty's. I think she's still back in business. Yeah. Yes. Domi. Yeah. Super nice. Well, she set up in a, a screen structure real quick after the She did. She did. Operating her business. Boy, it was just, it was heartbreaking. And so here I am, too. This is another thing from a photographer's aspect. I want to tell the story of this devastation, but I have to come up to you and go, Hi, are you okay? Can I just take my camp? And I don't do it like that, right? I feel like I'm pretty sensitive, but that's tough, you know? People at their worst moment, and here I am. Can I document you? <laughs> you know, that's difficult. It's another lady who pretty much lost most of her house and belongings. I thought this was an interesting photograph when we were flying around and showed um, out by the mobile home park in uh, Gasville the destruction of these trees laid over at the path of the tornado. So, I mean, the, the power of nature is incredible, right? We, you know, you just have to jive with it and live with it because we think we're in control, and we're really not, you know? So, just, here's the trailer park, and there was one person that lost their life. And a, a wonderful old man, and he talked to us, me and a, re a reporter and I that day, and it was, um, it was heavy. Yeah, so his wife, and that, this is, this is the gentleman right there. This was a shelter at the Cotter High School. And he, a lot of people stayed there because they were displaced, and he had lost his wife. And we revisited him a year later, and he was a bus driver, wonderful man. And um, Kevin, so, yeah. I, I, do you need to get signatures of these people? Not as a photojournalist. Okay. 
Now as a freelancer, as I am nowadays, if I wanted to f do a story or photograph for an editorial publication, let's say, Oprah or Southern Living like that, I might not have to, but most of the time I do want to get a model release. And hopefully the people will trust you, because who knows what they're, and in this day and age nobody does it anyway. My photographs are all over the place and nobody's asked me one time, they're on everybody's page, and it's, it's just the way it is, right? So, um, but no, not as a photojournalist if I'm documenting something's happened. But I always did ask ahead of time. I just would never come up and start shooting. I would and always introduce myself, and luckily most people knew me. And so I said, you know, I'm here doing this, and most people, it was amazing, you know, the, the media has some sort of, you know, different out, outlooks from people. But from my personal, personal um, experience, I was welcomed almost even in these difficult situations because I think they thought they realized I was genuine and sensitive to the situation because I'm a human being too. I mean, I, yeah, I've been home, cried a couple nights to be honest. I mean, it's, it's difficult stuff. Talked to her, photographed while she was talking to me. She lost most of her house, her things. This is down by um, <laughs> Melbourne. Check out the Jeep. Brand new Jeep wrapped around that tree. Nobody died down there. Can you believe that? His house was wiped out. I mean, once again, the power of nature to pick up a vehicle, a couple ton vehicle, you know, fling it through the air and wrap it around a tree. It's just incredible. So now we're moving down up to the floods that happened shortly thereafter. You know, record hundred year floods. I think we had two or three years of hundred year floods. Yeah, we really did. And so this is a lady that was displaced over ha on, on her house in the White River. These are some sheriff deputies. Jeff, you know their names? I know you do. Well, that's Ken Hopman and Randy Weaver in the back. Yeah. And so they let me motor with them upstream to go get here and come back. I have to say a lot of the local officials, the sheriff's office, were always really good. Yeah, come hop on in, Kevin. They, you know, I was very fortunate. And there, her, there she is uh, two days later in front of her house that is starting to recede a little bit the water, but not, not a lot. So that, that was that near Norfolk or Cotter? That was near Norfolk. Yeah. So, she used to be one of my foster parents. Um, I think this Sarah. is Sarah. Sergeant Lee Sarah. Sanders. Oh. I think so. That was the Norfolk uh, <laughs> States River Road there. Car got stuck, headlights still on, luckily nobody heard. So, uh, Cotter, that's the Cotter Bridge, Highway 5 Cotter Bridge. Now some of these, a lot of these photographs were picked up by the Associated Press and published nationwide. And so that one actually won some sort of award for I don't know why, but just, you know, a, a dock floating down the river. So, um, that's Cotter. And so you drive down Cotter and as you go to that swale and it comes up to and then if you come up to the downtown district, this was right there at that swale, right before you come up a little bit to that bridge. Mm -hmm. um, that's incredible. In fact, the highway, the highway 5 was covered with water at that low point where the city park is, and the highway officials didn't want you to drive through it. It was only a couple feet deep, but I talked my way through. <laughs> <laughs> so. And the sheriff's helicopter had to rescue some people from the River Ridge Road, other side of Shed Bridge, landed on the Shed Bridge, and picked up some people. First they flew out into the field on that River Ridge Road, picked up some people and brought them back. And so, I mean, not to be obsequious, but the Sheriff's Department is amazing. I mean, I've always been very <laughs> impressed, for sure. This is one of the a young gentlemen who was on his spring break from college to fish on the river, got stuck on a cabin that he was in, and so he comes back, and this is, I think, at the Cotter Youth Center, if I'm not mistaken, and everything was soaked as money. He's just taking his money out to dry it all out. So, And so, you know, while you have these floods, I always find it fascinating that when something horrific is happening, the ice storm, for instance, terrible, but at the same moment, there's some beauty to be found if you can see it, right? And so I would take the time to say, oh, that's a cool shot, I'll stop and get that, you know. Tells the story, very rarely are the floodgates open, so that's a rare event in and of itself. That's the River Ridge Road, they had washed out, 
from the from the White River. That was the Baxter County Road Department superintendent walking somebody to her house because they were obviously there's no traffic allowed on that road at that time. They had to come in with you know numerous dump trucks of gravel and rebuild that thing. So um, I happened to be there. Uh, that's a house on the White River on that River Ridge Road. Mud all over this guy's deck. It's like the second time he'd been flooded in 20 years. That's him inside. And there's the water level on his house. So, you know, once again, Mother Nature, I mean, my gosh, I mean, the best laid plans, right? You just really don't know, and we're so, we're so fortunate just to, to be here together, and it's a beautiful day out, obviously. So as I'm leaving the White River thing, there's, it had rained so much that there's these impromptu waterfalls coming off the bluffs right there on the other side. So I told them, I was with Armando Rios. I said, Armando, I gotta stop, I gotta get, I gotta get some, you know, some nature photographs, some cool photographs. So that waterfall you'll never see, because it only after the biggest deluge will you see something like that. But I, I thought that was actually quite beautiful. So. Yeah. And so we're now to the ice storm, oh, the third yeah. of the storms. And that was heavy duty too. I remember a lot of you guys can probably think back to that night and the crunching, crackling mm -hmm. sound, the sound of it. I wished back then I had recorded that. It's one of my, I really kind of lamented that, right? That I didn't get out there and record that sound crashing. It was incredible. And I live in the middle of the forest. So it was all around the house. Fortunately, that we were all okay, but. So, you know, and there's the beauty that to me that is, you know, the soldier stature, statue on the square, that was picked up and ran on New York Times, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, all around the world that photograph ran to tell the story of the ice storm. So, uh, that was one of my favorites right there. So that's me leaving from work. That's my Hidden Hill Lane. That's where I live on Hancock Road. So I thought, well, I'm going to stop and just start getting photographs right away. So anyway, it's icy. There's another one on the way to work. And uh, oh, and I meant to say this earlier that if you guys have any questions about anything, please stop and let's talk because I love talking photography. I love talking, and you know, this is the Baxter County Historical and Genealogical Society. This is. Documenting Baxter County history right here. Right. This is Baxter County history. It is. And so and I feel very fortunate to have worked at the paper for nearly 25 years and be part of that documenting Baxter County history. And I know I've gone into the society and looking for old senior focuses. You guys have a better archive than the paper sometimes. <laughs> and so it, it's fascinating to look back and to be have a little sliver micro part of that. Very fortunate. So that's another one on the way to work, and this is, uh, I think, the day after the ice storm hit. You know, telephone poles down in Mountain Home. That's the Presbyterian Church, I think, on Five South. Um, that's just, you know, ice. On that's actually the Lutheran Church. Is it the Lutheran? Okay, you're okay. the Christian Church one day. You're, you're right. I got married. You are right. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> but. So then there's you know more ice on the down lines. People freaked out and they all thought no gas was going to be available. So there were lines at every gas station. And I mean literally blocks of lines of people wanting to get gas for fear that there was going to be no gas because of a lot of power outages. Or generators. That's generators was a big deal. And that's, I went up with the um, sheriff also for the ice storm. And so there he is, Sheriff Montgomery, John Montgomery, checking out the surveying the damage, you know. That was pretty heavy for sure. That's in Cotter, big giant, I think that's a uh, red oak. Uh, just narrowly missed the, the main part of that house. I always like this one too, just because this new road kind of bisects this forest and you can just see it all um, ice covered like that. It gives us a sense of how beautiful the Ozarks are too. I mean, it's amazing. Oh, you know, in the air you got to keep shooting because you don't get to get up in the air a lot. So you just keep <laughs> shooting and you keep photographing. There was a semi truck that had kind of went off the road, and was needing help. There's downtown <coughs> Mountain Home. Yeah. 
during the ice storm, I think a lot of, you know, obviously people know where we're at, the courthouse, the Baxter Bolton, which is still there, yay. Um, I hope so. I hope it stays for a while. I think a, local, local newspapers are important if they, if they do it right. So a lot of people were displaced because the power was out for a long time. So this gentleman was at Eastside Baptist Church. They set up a shelter and uh, all by himself. And it was pretty poignant to see these guys. But it also brings out the best in people too because you have these people volunteering, right? So when these tragedies happen, it's a shame. But people really show how much we care about one another. People you don't even know, right? I mean, it's one thing to care for your mother and your father and your friends, but people you don't even know, that shows we really are connected. It's, we, we do care about each other. What was great about this that really speaks to me when I went back at it, this was a deaf couple. This was a Mountain Home High School, high school kid who had started to learn how to sign, and he, walked, he was acting as a go-between. And so he could learn how to sign better, and he was spent time with them and helped them with everything they needed in that shelter. You know, a high school kid, I think that's just fabulous. A nice portrait of some old guy that was displaced who was at the armory catching a little, I think he was like nearly 90 years old, you know, displaced out of his house, and you know, it's tough. Same thing, and he's actually reading a newspaper. <laughs> Does that happen anymore? I always say this, you know, people always want their information, right? You can't get the flippin' high school game in USA Today. So you need local news, right? You have to have it. Um, but the radio, the paper, but the way it's going to be delivered is going to be different because if I, I don't have a grandson, but I, a granddaughter yet, but if, my, if I do, any kid that's born here in the last few years are not going to be holding a physical paper. Mm -hmm. They're going to be going like this, you know. Mm -hmm. But they still want their information. So that's, that's the difficulty that we're facing right now. This is super poignant too. She had been displaced, I think this is still the ice storm, she had been displaced in the flood. So this was her second time in like nine months that she had to leave her house and go to a shelter. This is Eastside Baptist Church. I forget his name, I wish I knew it. He was with the, um, with the uh, armory bunch back there, the reserve soldiers, and he had helped her when she was displaced before. Mm -hmm. And she made a, made a beeline to him to thank him once again. So they shared this, to me, a very mm -hmm. poignant moment. Uh, he was there to help her again, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I love that. <laughs> So more ice, you know, the, you know, we had, there were um, utility companies from around, I think, the nation that came to help us, you know, and so I just like the ice. Ice is beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> Something about that. Kevin, I had to go to the North Arkansas Electric Co-op during that thing for, for right. something. When I walked in there, there were two sheriff's deputies, our guards, people had come in there and it threatened the people because they weren't getting their electricity turned on in time. Oh my and gosh, right, right. right. Oh, my God. Yeah, you know, a little a little understanding yeah. goes a long way. We just had a disaster, so yeah, I hear you. This was in Bull Shoals. They were, some of these places in Bull Shoals were at without power for like two to three weeks. So they were keeping warm with the um, propane heater. I think it was a nursing, an, an elderly type of living situation. And here's the generator yes, line. The generator. <laughs> <laughs> that, that photograph is played nationwide too, you know. Yeah. People yeah. stand in line for generators. I think that is Lowe's or Home yeah, Depot, I think, Lowe's. with the orange. Yeah, and and so and then, here's and just a little background on that photograph. So I get there and I go, that's the story, the line. Mm -hmm. The huge line tells the story. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get an elevated view so I could see that. So I had one of the clerks roll in one of their rolling ladders so I could oh. get up there. It never hurts to ask. And so in my career, I always asked. And most of the time, people would say, yeah. If they said no, no big deal. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? They say, no, I don't want to be photographed. Or no, I can't get a ladder. But most of the time, they're super helpful. So I got the ladder. 
And here's what, of course, you know, with the guy with the camera on top of the ladder, everybody notices it, right? <laughs> well, I'm kind of wanting to get the photograph where they're not all looking at me, right? <laughs> so I stayed there for a long time and let them get used to me that, okay, this guy's up there. Forget him, you know. So finally I got one. I think if I remember right, I think there's like one person kind of looking at me or something. And I was like, darn it. But still, it was... It was so that was kind of my thinking behind Kevin, that. Kevin, yes. you you were saying that the day we had the grand opening at Walmart, I got to take the pictures there. Right. And everybody said, oh, the, the cars out there is unbelievable. So I went to one of the managers and he asked me if I could go up on the roof. Nice. Oh. And they let me. But they said, stay away from the edge. <laughs> exactly. After my own heart. I love that. I mean, you kind of want to, no tragedies. when you're sharing your photographs and stuff like that, you kind of want to bring something a little different than just the normal. You know, just yeah. a touch, just to get people to hang with you just that extra five seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, because if they're hanging on that page for five seconds longer, there's an ad down there that maybe the dentist had posted, and now they're on that page for just that much longer. You know, that was my thinking that, you know, I, I want to engage our readers so they can hang a little longer so it benefits not only the paper, but everybody <laughs> who advertised. So, um, well, you can just imagine that that clerk there in the apron is explaining to the people in the line that at 2.30 there's supposed to be another truck in. Exactly. Yeah. That's almost exactly yeah. the way it was. Yeah. They had got a big show the day the night before, before. <laughs> and there was more coming. And so they would wait until 2.30 or 3. Right. Or right. right. Then two right. weeks later, 75% of them brought them back. Oh, yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so, uh, <laughs> that's the, so you always you always have right waiting in line with mom and dad, good little boy. It's like okay, I had you know that tells a story too. I think just as much as the generator line, you know, what a cutie too with that red hair. My gosh, so that is a quick look back at. Um, that was great. Yeah. yeah so we still have a little time, don't we? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I'm going to move on. So let's see. <coughs> to some things that are, you know, a little bit different. So let's go like this full frame. Okay. So these are, I love the outdoors. I mean, I love photojournalism. I love to document things. But this is documenting just equally as much. So this was on a, a float trip. I love to float the area rivers and things. So this was on a float tip, trip down the Buffalo River. The lower part of the Buffalo River, fall color, amazing. I just thought it was so cool. And what I, what personally I love about this is the sycamore trees. Mm -hmm. I love sycamore trees because of that white bark. It reminds me of the aspen. It's our aspen sort of tree. We don't have those here, right? The white sort of gives you that beautiful contrast. So anyway, that's just fall color. This is, this is um, Alley Springs by Eminence, Missouri. And so for the photographers here, you'll appreciate this. It was pr pretty much a sunny day, right? But I wanted to get a long exposure, two, three, four, five seconds, to blur this water out, to give that glassy feel. But when it's a sunny day, it's tough to do, even if you stop all the way down to F-22 or however, and you lower your ISO as low as you can go, you're, all, you're still going to get 15th, 20th of a second, which will not blur this out. So what I did is put on a polarizing filter, still not enough to cut the light. So I had a variable neutral density filler filter that I stacked on my polarizing filter, and I got a three-second exposure on a sunny day. And so for anybody who wants those long exposures on a sunny day, usually you, you do them on overcast days because you've got less light coming in. Get a couple filters and just stack them up there in front of your camera, and it'll cut a lot of light. So, but I, I really think that makes the difference than having this you know, stopped. Having that blur just brings that to life just a little bit more. This is Althea Springs on the North Fork River up by Patrick Bridge. And I put this in there just for this reason. I just think it's a cool shot with these rocks in the foreground and all that. But after the flood like last year, these trees are all gone. It looks like a bomb hit that place. And this was so beautiful. It was so awesome. Now the spring's still there. The rocks are still there. But this... It, it, it's horrible, it's just, but anyway, that's one reason that if you guys ever get up there, you'll see that. Of course, we got the awesome university and the fireworks and the 
you know, really fortunate to have um, photographed those over the years. How's that time lapse? Now, how did there? you do that exposure? I mean, yeah, that, that's a 30 second exposure. So, you know, here comes one, shh, here comes another, shh, shh, right? <coughs> Anytime you take one exposure like that, you have to have a tripod. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right, you just have to. There's no way you can handhold something that's perfectly still for two, three, four, five seconds. I mean, Dorothy, you all the photographers know for sure. So this is one of my favorite spots on the Buffalo River. I call it, it's not officially called, but I call it Bear Claw Bend because to me, this peninsula looks like a paw sticking out. Do you guys see it kind of? Yeah. And so this is the very last bend on the Buffalo River before the confluence with the White River, which is right up there, and so um, and it's Where not. Where were you standing when you took that? On, on, on a bluff. Yeah, on a bluff here, and it's not like a known bluff. You have to break trail to get to it. So there's nobody knows it. Somebody turned me on to it a long time ago, and it's one of my go-to places. Um, it's down Push Mountain Road um, by the store. Take the right, go back in there. Last time I went this fall to get some fall photographs. On the way out, I was accosted by somebody who lives there who had a KKK flag, I hate to say it, in front of his thing. And so he threatened me that he was going to vandalize my car, Jeff, uh, <laughs> if I would ever come there again. But it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a road, and it has the National Park sign right there about how to behave. But he obviously didn't like anybody around his place. But anyway, keep that in mind. <laughs> Forget those directions. Yeah. Yeah. This was taken, the same day as this was taken, it's a detailed shot of some of these tall trees. Mm. I just think that's a cool study in green, I call it. So, uh, Mamantis clouds, one of those cool cloud formations. So, that was actually taken. 35 years ago with slide film. That's actually film. Oh, wow. <laughs> 33 now. So, anyway. And so, oh, you know, man. when it's hot in the summer, you gotta warm, you gotta cool off. This was, I think, um, Park Pride at Cooper Park. Oh. And the fire department, Mount Home Fire Department, would bring their fire truck, turn on the sprinkler, and kids would just I mean, come on, if you're a kid to run in the water. And this guy just loved it, though, so I just kept, like, hanging with him, <laughs> hanging with him. And, and he didn't even know I was there, and he did his thing, and I, you know, I just kept shooting, and that was my favorite one, yeah. with the water splashing off his face. And it's a piece of Americana, isn't it? I mean, it's like... Okay, so this, this is a photograph I really like. I called it Dew-Drenched Silk, Dazzles in the Damp Dawn. Um, so, but this was taken, another example of driving to work. My wife always says, keep your eyes on the road, because I'm always like, eh, look at that, you know. <laughs> so I saw these, all these spider webs filled with dew, or laden with dew, and so I pulled over the side of the road, jumped out, and made this fairly quickly. But what I like about it, and just for the photographers or anybody, that when you do these macro photographs like this, sorry, that doesn't help. You want to be perfectly parallel to whatever plane you're photographing. So if you think of the spider web as one plane, like a sheet of paper, right? You want your camera to be perfectly parallel to it to get everything in focus. If you're a little off parallel, if this is your camera and this is the piece of paper or the spider web, the depth of field is so minuscule when you go at um, high magnifications. So anyway, that's just a little tip that try to stay as parallel as you can when you do macro photography to whatever you deem the most important plane. Does any of this make sense? Are you guys? <laughs> so this is another cool story we got to do up at the Assumption Abbey by Ava, famous for their fruitcakes, right? And these guys, I think are Franciscan monks or some sort of monks, and this abbey has been there since before World War II. Amazing history. And they welcome anybody can come up there and stay a night if you want. Two nights, they have like a dormitory. They don't charge anything. Um, so we stayed two days. We stayed one night and two days. And the thing about these guys, it's quiet reflection. They do prayer all day long, but they have official prayer 
um, like six or seven times a day. And this was at three o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. We actually got up, a journalist at three in the morning. And so this was the only light in this, in this, in this room. And there were some other monks here. And he was su super nice. He goes, do what you want to do, you know. And so he was playing the zither. It was pretty cool, too. It was a cool sound, you know. And um, so that's Father Mark at Assumption Abbey. And you know the old dreaded uh, fruitcake joke, Johnny Carson, you know, just pat, well, there's only one maid and it's passed around forever, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, these guys make some good ones. They really do. They're really well known for their fruitcakes. So if you ever want to patronize a real fruitcake, that's where I would I'd get it, Assumption Abbey near Ava, Missouri. It's a cool place, and if you're ever just driving around looking for something to do, it's worth it. It's worth a stop for sure. You know, in life, I always said this at the paper, sometimes the team loses, right? That's part of life. Sometimes people don't make it home from war. And this was, I think, Sergeant Clay, Jimmy Clay from Cotter, coming back to the Baxter County Airport. And um, so grateful for his service, for everybody's service, I mean, he ever served. It allowed me to do that. <laughs> it's crazy when you think about it, how connected, even though, you know, I never served, I was always in between, but I just, it's, I don't know, it's just so heavy to me, and I just, I think there, it's actually a beautiful moment in and of its own way, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, we'll get to, now this is, this is, a little story behind this photograph. This is about a 10 minute hike behind my house. I live in the middle of the forest down Hancove Road, and for the and I've lived there 31 years now. So, sounds old, doesn't it? <laughs> 31. So anyway, I would I've photographed this place for 30 years, this beautiful lake view, it's Float Creek area. And I'd on and off, I'd hike up there and get some photographs. And every once in a while there'd be first fit sale sign. And I'd call and go, just curious way out of my price range. So. And so every four, five, ten years I call, well, the last two or three years there's a poor sale sign again. So I called and I said, ooh, that's kind of maybe doable now. The price had come right down, you know. So long story short, I cast out my 401k and bought 10 acres. That I bought this 10 acres. Aww. Not so much for um, an investment, although I hope it is, so I could go up there and photograph the place anytime I wanted. Isn't that crazy? I mean, I've had people go, really? You bought that just so you could photograph it? I did. So I'm working on a long, people ask me, are you working on any more books? I'm working on, working on a long-term project on this place. And my idea is, I'll run it past you guys, is photographs of only this place throughout the whole book. But they're never the same, right? Because the light continually changes. This is a westerly view. I think this is due west up here. So throughout the year, the sun sets over there, it comes back and forth, and so I've got this, I've been working on these for quite a while now, it's, it could still be another couple of years, so anyway, that's the story behind the Flow Creek stuff. Black Eyed Susan's American Painted Lady and um, Queen Anne's Lace with some um, Oxide Daisies. I just thought that was cool, you know, it's another one of those roadside photographs. I mean, I know you photographers, you just yeah. <laughs> you whip over and you're getting these photographs, so. And that's like North Fork fireworks, but, and I've photographed that every single year since they started, it's like 30 years. So I haven't missed one year of the fireworks there. And I've gotten some cool photographs over the years, but this is one of my favorite because of the red, white, and blue, yeah. and the stars. I mean, yeah. for some reason, yeah. it's sometimes those things are luck, but you, you got to make your luck by shooting, right? Just keep shooting, and something's going to... But um, that's that's a cool photograph. I actually made a poster of that, and I have posters for sale. I don't know if I, I maybe brought one or two with me, but um, that's been pretty successful for me, image. It's not all about the money, but you do have to, you know, eat. Yeah. So. <laughs> This, I love this. This is an abstract photograph, but I did no Photoshop trickery whatsoever. This is a straight up photograph of the surface of the water on Big Spring in Cotter with moss underneath it, you know, moss on the bottom. And so this is a fast shutter speed, so I stopped the motion, but isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. I mean, that is just straight up, like I said, no trickery, no filters. That's exactly how I photographed it. So I just, 
I really like that. That maybe harkens back to the 60s or 70s. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, this was another cool story. This guy is, his name was Elroy Chin. Oh, my God. Yes, and he was about 84 when we met him. He was just learning to read. Now, he's a very accomplished man, had a very successful career in business. And, um, but he went on to become the, the Arkansas Literacy Council's Ambassador of the Year. And for a couple of years, I think he was. And he was so awesome. He was awesome, just a wonderful man. But his whole thing, the reason he wanted to learn to read, which he did at 84, it's, you know, the old cliche, it's never too late. It's true. And he's, he's living proof, but um, he wanted to learn to read the Bible. He wanted to learn to read so he could read the Bible. Mm -hmm. And um, I just love those hands. Mm -hmm. Aren't those awesome? He, he was so cool. And this is just, you know, I was out on assignment for something else, and I saw the horse in the field with all these flowers, and this is a good example of real shallow depth of field, if the photographers know what I'm talking about, where you blur the background out, but also if you have foreground material, it'll blur out too. So blur, 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 the plane of focus is right. You always want to uh, focus on the eyes. So if you're doing a portraits of people, portraits of frogs, portraits of anything, Focus on the eyes because that's how we interact with each other. We, when I meet somebody, I look at their eyes. So when you look at a photograph of the person, you go to their eyes. So if the eyes are out of focus, it's disconcerting. But if they're in focus and other parts of the photograph are out of focus, it's acceptable. So that's a little tip. Always focus on the eyes. <laughs> but I thought that was just a neat little moment, right? Norfolk High School graduation. They do a cool candlelight ceremony because they have a small class and they can afford to versus like a big Mount Home class. But that was awesome. I like the natural light, you know, no strobes, no flashes. And a lot of cameras nowadays, you're able to shoot in low light. You know, they have really good low light. This was the day after the ice storm. I think we're two days after the ice storm. I had work like 24 hours. They said, take a day off. Of course, I went out with my camera, <laughs> and I, this barn I knew was there, and so I set up this shot, and this horse, paint horse, was way out of frame. And so I just sat there, and I was photographing, photographing, and s slowly but surely, this horse started to walk into my composition. And I said, oh, that's the element that's going to make the difference. Because, I mean, if you think about it, without it, it's still a cool shot. But with it, to me, it brings a little bit more life to it. So, and then I had, so I called this Iceborn ice born and Horse. Then I had a, an art teacher at the high school say, you should call it Every Barn Needs a Little Paint. <laughs> so, so, I have to give credit where credit's due. That's a good one. So, Every Barn Needs a Little Paint. So. This is the trip I talked about, my father-son trip to Alaska. This was in Kotzebue, Alaska, north of the Arctic Circle, taken like right at midnight. Oh. Land of the midnight sun, right? Yeah. And so she and I asked her permission. This was the slide film days too, so I remember this vividly. Fuji Velvia, 50 ISO, <laughs> super slow speed slide film. So I was hand holding it, and they used that as a cover for one of those Alaska magazines back. 98 or 99. I went ahead and sold that. But I first got her permission. I wrote back to Kotzebue, sent that a uh, copy of that photograph, and had her sign a release at that point. We were talking about oh, releases wow. earlier. Mm -hmm. So I just think that's a great photo. You can see, too, from the angle of the sun, see the shadow here? Mm -hmm. Sun is low in the sky, right? Yeah, I mean, near profile in the shadow. Yeah, isn't that something? So, uh, Land of the Midnight Sun, taken at midnight. That was that was meaningful photograph for me. And I've, I've developed this um, technique to stop action, where I use three different strobes, and so effectively you're not getting a shut, you're not getting a, an exposure from anything except the strobes, right? And so the strobes, most cameras will shoot at eight thousandths of a second. That's still not fast enough to stop the wings totally of a, of a hummingbird. But with these strobes, they only, their duration is like, if you dial them way down, is like one twenty-four thousandths of a second. 
So that's why you can stop that. What I love about this, it's not like the greatest hummingbird photo, but the detail mm -hmm. is so, to me, just exquisite. You see all that stuff. So isn't that amazing? You can see, I always look for highlights, catch lights, they call it. See the two catch lights? Mm -hmm. So I've got two strokes here, and you got one behind him, kind of like rim lighting him from behind. Kind of a technical aspect. Thing, so. Oh. This oh. I call stuck in the middle again. <laughs> RR. So, but this was an assignment I did to go cover a special um, education luncheon years ago. It's right around 2000. I remember vividly. And you know, and I want to get something different, so I used a long exposure, but I did hand hold it. I held the camera up like this. It's one fifteenth of a second, which is long enough for the blur to imply the motion, right? So, um, but yet. In the middle of a wheel or in the middle of anything turning, it doesn't turn as fast in the middle as the outside, right? That's true. So that's why she's somewhat in focus mm -hmm. and all the other kids are out of focus because she's in the middle. I love her look too. It's like she's hanging on and <laughs> it's almost like she's alone by herself, but not, you know? So another uh, mountain bike race I covered just a uh, long exposure with the strobe at the same time kind of when you pant you pant with the subject as it's moving by so you get this and it, it implies motion so I really like that Ooh. this is Star Trail on the um, 11 Point River camped out there one night and that's a legitimate Star Trail that's a 20 minute exposure or 30 minute exposure you know no after effects, which you can do nowadays. You can take a hundred photographs and put them all together. But this is a straight up old time photograph where you just left your camera on for a long time. I like that. This is cool too. This was a very still night. It was. I've been asked that. You know, how'd you keep the leaves so still? It was dead, dead quiet. Um, I forget, but one of the local pastors called me up and said he was so taken with this. We published this in one of the magazines, the Little Magazine that we do. And he said, can I use that as the basis for a sermon? Well, of course, you know. <laughs> but I just thought, how we touch each other, right? How a photograph can touch people, right? Um, you know, like the baby that you post. That touches people. Or you post that you lost your mother or something. People, they want to know what's happening with each other. So, And this is just, you know, a streak of pink in the sky, magenta kind of thing. Silhouetted trees. That's right outside the Bolton's back door. Sometimes you get lazy, you know. You go out there, there's a red bud and there's one of the bath of pears and so And sometimes the photographs are right in your backyard though. They're right in front of you. You know, you think you have to travel the world to get these awesome things. And people will ask me like, you know, where would you like to go if you had could go anywhere you want? Well, who does I you know, Alaska was awesome. But you know what? It's all right here in our backyard. The beauty of the universe is right here. Yeah, you don't really have to travel. Now, would I love to travel to some of these awesome places? Of course. But do I have to travel to, get, to make awesome photographs? No, you don't. So, this is Stone Creek Ranch, you know. They, they're, they're pretty active here recently. And that's Arville Bass. Super, super guy. It's a snow day. I was just driving around getting photographs. I called up Arville and said, can you take me horseback riding? <laughs> so I kind of pushed for this photograph, but so we went horseback riding on a snowy day, and he, I stopped my horse, got off, had my backpack with my camera gear and everything, and um, he went down the creek, and I just think that's a cool yeah. Americana mm -hmm. photograph. Mm -hmm. You know, the Cotter Bridge after one of the snows, you know, I got a lot of photographs, but I waited for a car. It made a difference. Mm -hmm. The one element that brought that to life versus just the bridge by itself. The bridge by itself would be awesome. But with the car, it's, it just brings it to life. This is American Beach, fall color American Beach trees over by Steel Creek on the Buffalo River. So we do live in a beautiful place, don't we? It's amazing. Oh, you know, summer fun, right? So I went out to Cranfield Swim Area, and this young girl was playing in the water. She was doing this. and. I got her name and ran it in the front page, and people loved it. So, was she doing a backflip or? No, she just stuck her head in the water and came up real quick, you know, with that long hair yeah. and just kind of flung it back. Mm -hmm. So, that was cool. 
And, you know, okay, here, we'll end with the Bomber football team. Uh, this is a few years ago, that's Coach Mahan, Benji Mahan. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, they prayed before every game. And you know what? The Bombers can use all the help they can. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's not nice, but I'm sorry. So, so that is it. And I have, I have one special, a minute and a half, um, little piece I put together. Um, that features my, not my, I don't really, you know, even though I own that property on the books, it's not really mine. I won't be here forever. It'll be somebody else's. So I'm more of the stewardship of this place. Yes. But this is, um, this is a little uh, piece I put together, especially for you guys. So this is the world premiere. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope it works. We'll see. <laughs> I do have cookies. My wife made cookies just this yeah. afternoon. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's good. That's why I brought them. And so I just want to say thank you. You know, it's been I I love talking photography, sharing what I do, and I any questions, hit me with them. So yeah. Um, they say everybody gets 15 minutes of fame. This is fantastic. But I don't know if you remember. It was in the early 90s. Jane Andrewson and I were in period costume at the Wolf House. And you and Mr. Wallace took my picture, put it on the front page of the Baxter Bowl. I do remember. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I was a lot better then, but... <laughs> it's, it's crazy because people talk about names, right? I'm not good with names. And I'm not really the greatest, but I can remember every single photo shoot I ever did. If I look at a photograph, I can know exactly when I took it, who was there. I, I, I don't know. I just do. I just It's a, it's a bane and a blessing, right, to, to remember all that. And, but, but yes. Oh, my sister wouldn't say this. This is my sister Rhonda. She was over by uh, by the American Legion one day, and you were over there taking pictures, and you have a picture of her by the flagpole. I do remember. Oh, see. Oh, yes, and you were with, amongst all the flags there at American Legion. I remember vividly. I have it on my computer if you want to look at it. <laughs> Eagles, Eagles got bankrupt. Yeah. Shame on him. He was just bored. He left. He didn't have any of that. So, right. Anyway, I mean, I did bring a few books and a couple prints, but no big deal. So I just want to say thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.